Stanford University. Thank you, Mark. Is this uh, mic on? All right, sounds like it. All right, thank you, Mark, for the introduction. And uh, good afternoon, and thank you for coming to hear a little bit about my PhD. Uh, today I'll be discussing the synergy that we get when we combine an offshore wind and wave energy farm. And that's particularly true in California, where the Pacific Ocean is this vast, untapped renewable energy frontier that we have just off our coast. Um, my thesis is that when we combine these two, we get, it yields several synergies. And the most important of that is probably going to be facilitating integration of this variable renewable power into the electric power system. That will be increasingly true as we add more and more renewables in our system. That synergy comes primarily from we're just simply aggregating the power output of two diverse renewable energy resources offshore prior to connecting them to the electric power system. And that's, that's where most of the benefit comes from. So my agenda today, I'll introduce um, what one of these farms might look like with a simple diagram. I'll outline the four synergies I've identified as I've been going through the PhD. Um, then I'll take a step back and we'll look at um, why we want to go offshore with renewables at all when we have such great resources onshore, um, what the offshore wind and wave energy resource are. Uh, I'll briefly discuss offshore wind turbine technology and wave energy converter technology. Um, and then I'll jump into um, the meat of my PhD and some quantified synergies I've identified when we combine these two. So this is what a combined offshore wind and wave energy farm might look like in diagram form. So I have uh, co-located um, wind turbines and wave energy converters, and they're lined up along these um, electrical submarine cables that collect the power, and they bring it to a central offshore substation. And then that power is transmitted on much larger cables onshore at very large distances often, onshore where it's connected to the electric power system. The electrical framework of this is each um, wind turbine and wave energy converter is applying torque to a generator, and that generator is producing three-phase electric power. It's usually under one kilovolt. So then at each device, you step up um, that voltage with the transformer up to about 30 kilovolts, um, which is what these um, little collector lines run at, about 30 kV. So most of the offshore wind turbines and farms in Europe, uh, each of those strings, um, they'll have several of these strings connect uh, 8 to 10 wind turbines, and they're bringing on about 30 to 50 megawatts of power. And then what I've drawn here is the high voltage direct current option of taking all this power collected offshore and sending it onshore. So there'll be a transformer that'll further step the power up, take the AC current generated by the generators, switch it to direct current through voltage source converters. Um, it'll send that power ashore on very large um, submarine cables. Usually each one is operating at plus or minus 150 kV. And then onshore, you'll reconvert the direct current to alternating current and then connect it to the grid. So if you have a wind and wave farm that's in this sort of configuration, you end up getting uh, four synergies. Um, the most important of which is probably the top one in that you can reduce the integration requirements of having less variable power because you combine them offshore. Um, the second one is a combined farm is likely to use less transmission capacity offshore, which is a very expensive component of these farms. Um, when you have a combined farm compared to operating a wind farm separately or a wave farm separately. And these next two, I'll just explain briefly at the end of my presentation and more with anecdotes, is that obviously you're going to have an increased uh, renewable energy yield out of the, the ocean because you're have two resources that aren't competing with each other in the same location. Um, and then finally, kind of more for the business and developer aspects, is there's likely to be several design and operating cost um, reductions when you do two uh, technologies as opposed to one alone. So why we, would we want to go offshore when we have such great stuff onshore? This is, a, I think, a beautiful map of the NASA of Earth at night. And you can see from all the countries that consume the most amount of energy, the United States, the European countries, in the East Asian countries, their coastlines are exceptionally clear at night. Um, that's obviously because we live there. So we have the demand side of the problem. Um, that's reflected in prices. This is a map of by county of residential electricity prices in the US. And clearly, coastal communities and coastal states like California, Hawaii, Texas, and the US eastern seaboard have high prices reflecting on that demand. So now we can turn to supply. What I've done here is I've mapped the US um, offshore wind resource 
that was done by NREL, and I've remapped it into five wind speed classes, yellow being below eight meters per second on an annual average basis, down to blue being greater than nine and a half meters per second. It's unlikely an offshore wind farm will be competitive in winds below eight meters per second, so you could ignore everything in yellow. But as you can see, Hawaii has phenomenal resource, and then most of the California coast all the way up to Washington has phenomenal wind resources. Um, and if I show the East Coast, it'd be very similar off Massachusetts and things like that. You'd see um, these kind of blue and pink and red colors. So just in 2011, um, EPRI, in conjunction with NREL, um, did a mapping and assessment of the wave power resource in the United States. And I've remapped it here again in five classes, um, going from yellow to blue. Um, blue is a 30 to 60 kilowatts per meter of wave power on an annual average basis. And that's sort of the target zone of most of the developers are going for. They want a resource that's at least that great, although some are targeting all the way down to lower resources like 10 to 15. So as you can see, the entire West Coast is in blue. And Hawaii has obviously a phenomenal resource that everybody knows about on the North Shore. So if I combine these two GIS resources, uh, actually let me pause for a moment and explain what a kilowatt per meter is. Um, the way they do this is you can actually understand wave resources. If you stood at the ocean and as you have a wave approach you, if you held up a one meter wide piece of plywood and tried to stop that wave, the amount of power that hit you in the face and broke your nose is kind of like, that's wave power. So it's one meter of wave crest coming at you incidental. Um, you're essentially holding up one of these uh, uh, planes normal. So what they do out in the deep ocean when you're not next to the shore where these wave devices are supposed to go, you have a one meter um, diameter circle that you spin around and you accept wave energy from any direction. And at any point in the US um, Pacific, you might have swells coming from the Northwest. You might have some swells from systems way all the way in the South Pacific and, and various wind wave components from different directions. And wave energy devices are usually tuned to capture one or two or three of those directions. Um, the buoys can capture most of the um, directions of wave, all 360. Um, so if I combine the wind and wave energy resource um, mapping, um, I've reclassed them in five classes. So for example, class four is winds with wind speeds on an annual average basis above nine and a half and wave power greater than 40 kilowatts per meter. And you can see that basically north of San Francisco all the way up the Oregon coast is just this incredible resource of wind and wave and they're co-located. And it makes sense that they're co-located. Um, in 2008, I actually used all the buoy data. There's a network of buoys operated by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. There's 12 of them off the California coast, and then there's another six or eight in Oregon and Washington. And when I took the wind speed data from the buoys, and these buoys have accelerometers that can measure wave parameters, and when I looked at um, those over long time series, some of them go back to 1980, because they were in support of offshore oil development in the Santa Barbara Channel. Uh, I found the exact same thing as this mapping work, which was primarily modeling by NREL and EPRI. You had a question? Year or? It's, it's an average basis of, it says in that diameter circle, you have 40 kilowatts per meter of wave power going through that circle on an annual average basis. So on some days you only have a small two kilowatt per meter wave, and then other days you have a giant storm with a 100 kilowatt per meter wave. And it says what's the average power that would go through that unit diameter circle out in the ocean? So you're saying each meter can extract 40 kilowatts continuously on average? For the year, correct. Well, on average, it's not per year, it's average. Yeah, on kilowatts. average over the year, correct. On average? Okay. Yeah. It's a tremendous resource, and that's why people are interested in looking at wave power is just comparatively with solar and wind, you have a very dense resource because that solar energy is first concentrated in winds, and then the winds concentrated in waves. Which leads me to why um, we have a wind and wave resource that are co-located. So winds generate waves, and those the height and the power in the waves is a function of the wind speed and the length of the fetch. And what ends up happening is as it goes from ripples to wind seas to swell, the wave mechanics begin to overtake and dominate kind of the, the pattern and the movement of those waves. And they actually accelerate out of the region where they were originally developed and actually move faster across the ocean than the low pressure system and the winds that might have created them. And so if I look at a map of where the winds are on the ocean, we have, um, these are 
This is quick scat data from NASA of the um, wind power resource over the ocean. And you can see in the northern hemisphere winter, your source region is off the coast of Japan towards the west coast of North America. It's from the eastern seaboard towards northern Europe. Um, obviously, you get the reverse um, in the summertime. And one advantage we have is we have a semi-permanent um, Pacific high pressure system that spins winds clockwise over the Pacific. And that accelerates winds actually around the Cape, around, particularly around Cape Mendocino, Northern California, and Oregon. And so we have also this uh, summer uh, wind resource. Those source regions are, have a lot of these low pressure systems. This is the Alaskan coast, and this is the Aleutian Island chain. These low pressure systems generate gale force winds. They're generally moving east or south. And you have strong wave power development on the southern side of it, where you have the movement of the pressure system to the east, as well as winds flowing towards the east. So counterclockwise moving around the low pressure. And you can see that here in this map of wave heights by the NOAA Wave Watch uh, model, which does forecasting for waves. So in this source region, you might have waves that from peak to trough are 14 or 15 meters high. So those are ginormous waves. And um, those waves propagate across the ocean. And once they've been generated, they're moving almost independent of the low pressure system that generated them. And they impinge upon the California and Oregon coasts. Um, they kind of diffuse out. But you still have phenomenal waves you know, five and six meters from peak to trough. So you have both a Pacific coast wind resource in winter and summer and a wave power resource that's strongest, obviously, in winter, but is some component in the summer as well. So I want to jump now to um, offshore wind technology. Currently, the appeal of offshore wind technology, and the Europeans are, are harnessing this, is that you can get exceptionally, you can get economies of scale. You can get larger turbines. You know, the largest installed right now is 6 megawatts with a 126-meter diameter rotor. And you simply can't build those onshore. They're, they can't be good, put onto trains because the blades are too long. And you can't put them on roads because of curvature of the roads. And the larger designs are coming. The next um, commercial series will have a rotor diameter of 164 meters. And I've put up in um, perspective drawing what a US football field looks like. So you can imagine it's capturing several football fields worth of wind energy. And you can do that with a single generator as opposed to many generators and many towers that you have to do on land. Um, the market is entirely in Europe, although Korea, Japan, the US, um, and China all have plans for offshore wind turbines. You've probably heard about Cape Wind. Um, the EU has targets of up to 40 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2040, or correction, 2030. Um, and that's because they're simply constrained by putting onshore wind. And actually, they just installed the largest offshore wind farm in the Irish Sea. It was 367 megawatts. And that went online in February. Um, I could show a bunch of pictures of wave energy technology. And you're probably familiar that there's probably 100 different varieties. And about five of them are in various states of development. Instead, I want to introduce you to the design problem of a wave energy technology. What you're trying to do is extract out of these waves, which are stochastic and low frequency, they have potential and kinetic energy. You're trying to take that energy and turn it into, with some device, which I've made in blue, a constant high frequency, 50 hertz in Europe, 60 here, electrical energy. And that's a significant design challenge. Some devices kind of skirt that and would just transmit to shore hydraulic energy in terms of pressurized water. What it ends up looking like is all the devices sort of have three things. They do some variety of extracting the power, some conversion of it, and then some transmission of it to shore. Most of the device design varieties are here in how they're absorbing that energy. Some use a medium, such as air, trapped inside of a, a chamber. And obviously, the reaction point is a critical design feature. The generators, you have several different varieties, uh, hydraulic ones, low head ones, linear generators, air-driven turbines. And then electrical cables are, are pretty standard, as well as pipes. And all the devices in common have the challenge of Stain moored in position, whether they use either chains or a foundation. Because your waves might be just a few inches of wave power coming through, or you might have a massive wave coming through in a storm. And you have to have a device that withstands that and stays in position. And then, although we have great experience with uh, marine engineering about having things survive in the corrosive ocean environment, you're still expecting to have these devices deployed for 20 years. So there's some material questions about having moving devices of marinized steel out in the water for that length of time. And then the final design problem will probably be the environmental one of what will be the environmental impact of this uh, technology. 
on the coastal environment. So now I'll move um, to start to answer the question of how feasible is combining offshore wind and wave technology. And that's particularly true in California. We have ex really deep water um, right offshore. So what's required is floating offshore wind turbines. Um, currently, the longest one that's been in operation is in Norway. It was done by an oil company that had extensive um, marine experience. It's a 2.3 megawatt design. It's been floating in the water since 2009 in the very challenging North Sea environment. Um, and I haven't heard of any problems. It's been out there continuously, and they've even post how much energy it's delivered. Um, and then DOE just funded um, another company called Principal Power, and they've had a device floating off the coast of Portugal for about six months now. They deployed it um, in the fall last year. And it has a different design. It uses sort of three poles as opposed to a single one. Um, with wave energy devices, um, I'm not picking any winners, but there are about five device developers that have had second or third generation full-scale prototypes that have been in the water for multi-year periods. Most of them have been in Scotland at the European Marine Energy Center. And some of them are under sort of limited commercial agreements where utilities sort of want to, I guess, literally get their wires wet and find out how these devices operate. Um, the timeline for probably both of these is in the three to 10-year timeline, they would be fully commercial. Um, and they'll be commercial sort of at the same time, so it's a reason to sort of combine them if we're going to go offshore, since both of these are targeting the U.S. West Coast. So now I'll jump to the meat of my um, presentation and my PhD work. So the most important thing is that we can reduce the grid integration requirements if we combine these two farms. And you get sort of three advantages. The first being you have, you significantly reduce the hours of zero power output when you combine the two technologies. And that'll yield what's known as a capacity value uh, improvement for the farm. And a capacity value is just a measure of how valuable is that power for the electric power system. And I'll go into detail on that in a little bit. Um, the second one is that you reduce the variability of aggregate power output because they're not entirely correlated. Um, and that has great benefits in reducing the ramp rates of renewables, especially with wind. Onshore can come up extremely fast and go down extremely fast. That requires the rest of the generation fleet to sort of respond in kind. Um, I won't illuminate um, this one too much, but the forecast errors of wind and wave, um, are those errors are not correlated. So when you're doing an aggregate forecast, you have a reduction in the aggregate um, forecast error. All right, so I'll show you my uh, methodology. It was to use all the raw data, um, the wind speed data and the um, wave parameter data measured by this network of buoys. These buoys were installed back as far as 1980, so I usually end up with multi-year data sets. I used um, an offshore wind farm or wind turbine that had a lot of ex commercial experience and a wave energy device that's one of the sort of five or six leading designs. And I created these long time series of what would be the power output of a wind farm if it was located at this buoy or a wave power device if it was located at this buoy. And there end up being synchronous time series. So now what I can do is combine these two electrically offshore before I bring it onshore. With it, and as I combine these two time series, I can mix them in various uh, percentages. I could have a farm with 75% of the capacity in wind and 25% in wave. And I would get this sort of power output profile if I combine this week and this week. And similarly, a 50-50 or a 25-75. And throughout my work, I use five case studies. It's usually all wind, all wave or one of those three mixes in between. So the first thing we might ask is, what is the simple correlation between these two time series of power output? Because that alone will indicate to some degree how much less variable the aggregate power output would be. There's already a great methodology for that that's been done extensively onshore with wind. So this is um, power output correlation. It's just Pearson's correlation coefficient between two time series hourly power output. The distance between two wind farms. So each one of these points is Correlation between a wind farm, two wind farms 400 kilometers apart. This was done by Sinden in 2007. And you can see, as you get farther apart, because of weather systems, you get a declining correlation between their power. And I can do the same thing for the 12 buoys for both wind and wave offshore, except this time I not only have geographic correlations, but I can have resource correlations. So again, hourly power output and the distance. And the California coast is about 1,000 kilometers um, from San Diego to the border of Oregon. So this is the power output um, correlation between two offshore wind farms at these various uh, distances offshore. And as you can see, you have the nice same sweeping curve down. And 
Because California is in a more complex like region meteorologically than the UK is, which is just simple northern Europe um, weather systems, you can actually have zero um, correlation between a farm, say, in San Diego and then one up by um, Eureka, uh, for example. I can do the same thing now for two offshore wave power farms. Um, the first thing to know is there in black um, is that there's a more linear relationship um, between these, uh, the distance as you go out. And it's also greater than it is for wind. And if you remember from that original animation of the wave power going across the ocean, those waves become kind of increasingly coherent in the swell system. So it makes sense that you would have higher correlations at a given distance than you would for two wind farms at those locations. So now I can plot in these red uh, triangles the correlation between a wind farm at one buoy and a wave farm at another buoy. As you can see, at these short distances, you already have lower correlations and hence lower variability in the power output than you know, two wind farms that are up to 300 kilometers apart or wave farms that are up to maybe 500 kilometers apart. And there's a difference between the um, triangles that point up and the triangles that point down. The triangles that point up have higher correlations, and that's because that is an offshore wind farm to the north and a wave farm to the south. And that actually really makes sense from the meteorology and the oceanography. You imagine a low pressure system, it's coming towards California, it's generating waves that proceed ahead of the low, of the low pressure system. And so as it hits the coast, you would have strong waves already at a southern location and you'd have strong winds at a northern location. And the arrows that point down are the, the reverse condition where you're looking at a wave power farm to the north and an offshore wind farm to the south. But my sort of uh, thesis is you might as well just stick them at the same location. So these are actually uh, 12 circles on top of each other where I'm looking at the correlation between wave at the buoy and wind at the buoy. And as you can see, you're basically achieving the same level of reducing aggregate power output as you are for wind farms up to say 300 kilometers apart and wave farms up to 500 kilometers apart. Um, and that's important from a utility perspective because all of these dots that have a distance in between them imply that you can stick variable power in at point A and then variable power in at point B and your network onshore will manage that variability. There's a lot of assumptions baked into that because there's always transmission constraints onshore um, if you are going to do the aggregation offshore, you're just sticking less variable power in at a single point, and that has a lot of grid benefits, especially for the network. So now another way to look at those time series is to just put them into um, histograms. So this is the probability of a 100% wind farm generating zero power, which it does quite a bit of the year. Um, those are for all the wind speeds below about four meters per second. Um, and then a wind farm produces full power minus some rotor wake losses and electrical losses, also quite a bit of hours in the year. Um, and that's because you generate the same amount of power between about 12 or 13 meters per second and 25 meters per second. A wave um, farm has slightly, well, significantly different um, power output profile. It has fewer hours of no power than a wind farm, primarily because you can accept wave power from any direction. And you, partly because of the state of technology with wave energy devices, they're sort of overbuilding their generators and you don't have as many hours at full power with a wave power device as you would with a wind turbine. So now I can combine um, these, these histograms and look at what a combined farm might look like. And you can see you get drastic reductions in the hours where this farm essentially sits idle offshore. And you also have some reductions of hours where the farm is at full power. And that actually have a hidden benefit I'll discuss later. At a particular buoy, as an example, um, a 25% wind farm, 75% wave farm, this buoy was in Northern California. It only sit idle for 70 hours a year, um, not generating any power. And that's actually significantly less than even a nuclear power plant, which is offline for usually a, a couple weeks in the spring for maintenance and refueling. Um, a wave power device, you would get uh, 242 hours of no power. A wind farm does spend a lot of time completely offline, and it often is consuming power at that time for its control systems of about 1,300 hours. So those are, that's sort of a statistical look at um, what a w combining wind and wave would do. But what I've tried to do now, and I'll show next, is put that in perspective of the electric power system. Because you're not going to get paid um, for generating you know, zero power for only 70 hours compared to 1,300 hours. It's more in relation to what does that power output profile mean for meeting your load. 
So what I've done to, to replicate that is build a simple model of the California system. All load is met by combined cycle gas turbines, obviously onshore, and wind and wave offshore. And I'd like to introduce the concept of what's known as electric power reliability. And it's a simple equation that, probably the most important equation for electric power, is just you, you balance generation with load. And you end up um, just finding out what, how reliable you are at meeting this equation by developing a capacity outage probability table for your entire fleet of generators. And what this table is simply stating is, if I have 50 gigawatts of power, what's the probability that I'll have 49 gigawatts online at any given point? Or 48 gigawatts or 47 gigawatts? Because lots of plants are offline for forced outages or maintenance, things like that. And then you do a similar um, peak load probability table um, for the load. So you would look at the upcoming peak load season, which is the summer for California, and you do the same thing. What's the probability my largest demand this summer will be greater than 50 gigawatts or greater than 49 and so forth. And when you convolve these two probability tables, you're able to find out the loss of load index. And that loss of load index is a metric of essentially how many times am I going to fail to balance that equation. And that uh, metric has a, a bunch of different units. You might look at how many hours a year do you fail to meet that equation, or how often do you fail, or how much energy did that represent when your generators couldn't meet the load that was demanded. Um, graphically, I think it makes more sense. You can imagine there's a probability distribution of at any given moment in the summer what your generation fleet is most likely going to be capable of generating in terms of gigawatts, because California is about a 50 gigawatt system. And then similarly, you might do the same for load of peak load. And any time you sample simultaneously from your generation probability distribution and your load probability distribution, and you end up in this region where your generation is not sufficient to meet your load, you get your loss of load index. So every generator is assigned a capacity value using that model I just um, showed you. And this is true both for renewables and for a natural gas plant or a nuclear power plant. What you end up doing is you'll add in um, your new generator, say 100 megawatts of wind. You'll update your probability table of generation. Because you have more generators online, you should be able to serve more load. And that increase in the load served is what's known as your capacity value. It has lots of different terms. Um, it's often called the effective load carrying capability of a plant. But what it's representing is, statistically, how much does this generator contribute to me matching that, uh, that equation of balancing generation and load? Um, and I'll introduce another concept that most of you probably have heard of. It's the capacity factor. Um, and that's essentially the average power output of a generator over a year. Um, it's often expressed in a percentage wise of what's the total amount of energy I generated over the year and how does that compare to the total amount of energy I could have generated had I generated all 8,760 hours a year. Um, so in the case of a 100 megawatt wind farm that I add on to the system, uh, I might have a capacity factor of 40%. So equivalently, it produced the same amount of energy as a natural gas plant that might be 40 megawatts running all year. And so its capacity factor, 100 megawatts installed, capacity factor of 40 megawatts. Its capacity value, because it's based on the when it's going to generate power, might only be 20 megawatts, so 20%. So you can kind of look at a ratio of um, the capacity value to the capacity factor to get an indication of how much is this generator contributing to meeting my peak load, which is always the complaint that people have about renewables. It's a hot summer day, and the wind is not blowing, and therefore I have to have other generator online. So there's, there's a metrics, and there's a simple models you use for all generators to do this. But to put it in another way, it's essentially looking at how much power can I statistically rely on to meet my peak load divided by the average power of my farm? So in the case of that 100 megawatt offshore or 100 megawatt farm, on average, you could statistically say it meets 20 megawatts to peak load divided by 40. You'd have a system integration value of 50%. Ideally, you'd obviously want to get to 100%, um, but already 50% would be pretty decent for renewables. Um, in most cases, onshore ones are significantly lower than that. Um, so here's the results of looking at adding on 5,000 megawatts of offshore wind and wave just so I could get a real big system impact look on the grid. Uh, the first thing to notice is an offshore wind farm, 66% of its average power output you could assume contributes to peak load. And on 
wave, which has much fewer hours of no power output, as I showed earlier, about 75% of its average power output, you could assume, is helping you meet peak load. And again, here's the synergy of combining wind and wave. You don't have a linear increase going over. In fact, you have a nonlinear increase where this 25% wind, 75% wave farm, 88% of the average power output is actually meeting your peak load in the summer. So now I kind of um, jump to the second uh, synergy that compared to an equivalently sized, say, offshore wind farm, you can generally reduce the amount of transmission capacity you have to build to connect uh, an offshore combined farm. So again, I showed this diagram, and what I've done is I've done a case study where I'm looking at putting this farm in three different buoys offshore of California, testing the cable distance um, from 30 to 60 kilometers offshore. It doesn't necessarily indicate that it's 60 kilometers from the nearest land. Obviously, these cable routes sometimes go parallel to the coast and into a, ca um, a cove or a harbor where they can connect to the grid. Um, and then I've used 1,000 megawatt farms because I'm trying to test a large system impact. And um, if you remember these uh, histogram um, profiles, you can rearrange the same data in a cumulative sense on what's known as a generation duration curve. And in this generation duration curve, you're looking at the percent of time in a year I'm operating at a certain percentage of my rated power output. So this is for a 50% wind and 50% wave farm. So it's really the exact same information as contained here, but showed in a cumulative um, sense. And what it says for the case study I use is like a 10% of the year, I would expect this farm to be generating 700 megawatts or more. And the immediate observation is it doesn't really spend a lot of time at full power. So it begs the question, why build a transmission link that's going to be 1,000 megawatts for a 1,000 megawatt farm that never generates really 1,000 megawatts? And so if I just cut that, I would have to curtail a certain amount of energy. If I only built a transmission link that could transmit 80% of the power or 800 megawatts. And the optimization becomes, uh, and you can formulate this in different ways, but I look at what do I lose each year in energy sales revenue versus what did I save in capital costs, which would be if you did debt financing, it'd be essentially a reduction in your um, loan payment per year. Um, the way I formulated um, the optimization is I do a marginal revenue versus marginal cost approach, where I simply start out with no transmission capacity to the farm, and I incrementally increase the capacity to transmit, and I'm just comparing as I do that incrementally, what's the marginal revenue increase versus the marginal cost. As long as the marginal revenue is greater than the marginal cost, I'd continually add more and more increments of transmission, up until it became non-economical. The results of that, again, five generation cases, uh, three different buoys with different wind and wave resources and four different distances offshore, you find that the offshore wind farm always selects 956 megawatts um, to connect the 1,000 megawatt farm offshore. You may ask why are these numbers sort of strange, 956 and 874, is there's only two manufacturers that build high voltage direct current transmission links and they build their sort of technology in um, incremental blocks. And so you really, if you wanted to connect a 1,000 megawatt farm, you really only had two choices anyways, 956 or 874. Um, so all the punchline is that all the generation mixes select the lower option because they spend fewer hours at zero power and fewer hours at full power, so you don't need to build the full capacity. Um, 46030 has a phenomenal wind and wave resource. It was actually the very best. It's off the uh, Cape Mendocino. Um, since it has such a great wave resource, it also selects the highest amount 4628 has a lower wave resource, so it also drops down and selects a lower transmission capacity. And then um, this shows the effective distance on the optimization. The wave resource here is good, but it's not good enough to build the larger transmission link if you get to 60 kilometers offshore where you're going to be paying for another 10 kilometers of, of cabling. All right. So these last, um, this. This third uh, synergy is sort of an obvious one if you can get more energy out of a per square kilometer of, of ocean space that you use because you're using two resources. However, a not so obvious one um, that I've yet to quantify but I've sketched out is that you can actually reduce the array wake losses of um, a wind farm. This is a, map, or a picture of actually that new offshore wind farm that went in the Irish coast and the distance, or the Irish sea. The distance between this wind turbine and this wind turbine 
is a result of an optimization. You want them as far apart as possible so that the rotor wake, um, the wake that comes off this turbine, as it goes towards this wind turbine, it represents a velocity deficit in wind speeds and increased turbulence. So this wind turbine will collect less energy when the wind's blowing in this direction from left to right. Yeah, left to right. And it's constrained, that distance is constrained by the cost of an electrical cable and its associated electrical losses that runs along the seafloor to this wind turbine and then over to this offshore platform where the transformer is. If you insert a wave energy converter in between this wind turbine and this wind turbine on that same electrical cable, you're inputting more power into the same cable, so you need to increase the conductor size, which will reduce the losses. Um, and so now that you've reduced the losses and you're generating more power along that same stretch of cable, you've changed the value proposition. So now you can spread the wind turbines out. So now just because you've added wave energy devices in between your wind turbines, you can now generate more energy from the exact same wind turbines, which are further apart. Um, and this final synergy, um, I leave more to uh, the developer who actually pulls this off or in the business student who maybe wants to investigate it, is that a lot of the costs of these farms will go into sort of block units in the beginning. All the environmental studies um, getting approved by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. And it would behoove, for example, a wave energy developer who's gonna be the junior technology to join under an offshore wind farm where it's going to get to sort of share a lot of the engineering and design costs. And at the same time, supply to the wind farm a lot of the synergies I've discussed, particularly this top one, of providing less variable power output. So if you have uh, more questions, there's more information along on my website, um, or you feel free to email me. Um, I'd like to thank uh, my advisor, Mark Jacobson, and my PhD committee, um, as well as my atmosphere energy research group and my funding sources, which have been the Stanford Graduate Fellowship and the Lavelle Graduate Fellowship. So thank you. Yeah. What is uh, up the distance offshore in the uh, California region? Um, so that's, that's a great question. So there won't be an optimal distance per se. So if you go further offshore, you'll get better wave resource. And most of the devices want to be in 50 meters of depth water or greater. Um, and that's actually pretty close to the coast in California because it's so deep. Um, with the wave, uh, or, or sorry, with the wind, it's essentially, if you can get a little ways away from the coast, it's, it's roughly the same. As you can see, um, when I map the, the wind resource, it's in essentially in a large band. So it'll be more a function of um, the bathymetry questions, of how exactly deep can you go, and um, are you far enough offshore for your wave energy devices. In California, it's pretty easy to accomplish. You don't need to go far offshore to get below 50 meters depth. Yeah. Uh, I'd first like to thank you for being among the one that serve the 99% of us. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, one question about the, two, uh, two questions. One, these devices um, have to be tethered to the ocean floor, correctly. Correct. OK. So what studies have been done to understand how this will interfere with whale migration and so forth? Yeah, that's, that's certainly the greatest objection and, and even the greatest concern I would have. If we have a, a rich marine life, especially mammal marine life off California. Um, a good example is actually those buoys. Um, some of them are moored in um, depths. I think the largest or the deepest is 800 meters. And so they have chains that go down. And um, I won't claim to be a marine biologist and answer definitively, um, but most um, whales are struck by moving boats. Um, and those, these things are going to be not moving. So it has, I, don't, uh, I won't say that's a definitive answer, and I'll leave that for marine biologists to, to figure out. But it's certainly a question if you have an entire field of wave energy devices and you have a, all these mooring chains hanging down, um, sort of what impact would that have? There's actually a chance that it'll become a habitat for a lot of other species. Usually when you stick anything in the ocean, stuff starts to grow on it. Um, one advantage, perhaps, of combining wind and wave is that you could share mooring locations. So you would kind of reduce the number maybe in, in half or a third. But um, yeah, I'll leave that for marine biologists and, and the testing that will go along with that. All these devices are being deployed, especially with a lot of consideration in Europe. So they're usually one device, and they're out there testing those things. Thank you. Yeah, in the back. Oh, that's, you just, 
mentioned the same thing I was going to ask. So would you imagine that the wind and wave devices would actually share moorings, or would they just be located in the same general fields? Um, I think you'll get significant cost and environmental benefits if you um, shared the mooring devices, because most of these will be either um, drilled points or they'll be um, dead weight. And obviously, you want to reduce the number of connections you deploy for that. Um, I believe the Stat Oil, the floating high wind offshore wind turbine has three cables that go out in three different directions. So you would probably want to use those same locations you've already put on the shore or on the, on the surface of the ocean, the sea surface. So, yeah. Well, Thomas Edison got out of the DC business because it wasn't uh, particularly effective. Uh, why do you use DC to go from offshore to onshore and then convert back again? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, let me actually jump to uh, supplementary slides real quick for that. Uh, this is a part I missed for timing. So you actually have two options. Um, you could do high voltage alternating current, which is the top option, or you could do high voltage direct current, which is the bottom option. Um, the interest in doing the direct current is that those AC cables, um, you have all three phases in close proximity to each other. You have A, B, and C. And in between them, you have a dielectric separating the phases. So you get extensive amount of capacitance um, in these uh, submarine cables that are in alternating current. Um, and end up, as a function of distance and the voltage squared, you end up consuming a lot of reactive power in the cable. So you're actually limited by how far you can transmit um, submarine AC cables. And there's been a bunch of studies, and they find sort of economic breakover points between um, the losses of these AC cables, but then the benefit of only having a transformer and not converting the power. And usually that breakover point is somewhere between 40 and 80 kilometers offshore. Um, and most of the direct current links that go from like Norway to Denmark or Germany, those are all direct current. They're you know, a few hundred kilometers long and they're sending over megawatts of power. And you have a couple other advantages um, with these converter stations. These are the DC cables. Uh, you can actually control a little bit your um, power angle when you have these converters as opposed to AC, you're just, you kind of get what you have, so. Yeah, in the green, yeah. Um, so I kind of have a picture in my mind what, uh, you know, wind farm, but I don't have a similar picture for a gigawatt wave farm. And so when you're talking about, you know, 75% this, 25% that, uh, what's, how does that look spatially? Did they really coincide? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. I guess the, I don't know what it would look like per se, because actually what they're doing now is they're actually looking at in deep um, interest of what are the effects of large arrays of wave energy devices. And it's interesting, some large array studies show that you get more power out of an array um, than you would out of a single device. And that's because apparently when the wave field hits it, it increasingly becomes in resonance with the rest of the, the wave energy devices. You can think of wave power in a sense, you're sort of building a microphone and you're trying to capture that, those waves. Um, most of the wave power devices are, they're trying to shoot for one megawatt in size and they'll probably get larger, just like wind turbines have gotten larger and larger. So when you look at a 750 megawatts of wave energy devices, that's 750 devices, and that's really extensive. But with wind turbines going to seven megawatts, I'd foresee wave devices going similarly, so you wouldn't have as many devices deployed as kind of the current state of technology. Yeah, I'm blue. Um, yeah, I had a question about your systems integration value. Yes. I really applaud the idea of creating a quantitative metric to determine which energy generating technology best serves peak load. But um, I was wondering if the equation that sets it up is a little bit pathologic because I noticed the capacity factor was in the denominator. So that would mean that as capacity factor goes down, systems integration goes up. And if you had a generator that had a 0% capacity factor, which would be horrible, you'd actually get an infinite <laughs> systems. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, certainly. The equation, um, there's actually a more complicated formulation of it um, that actually uses dollars. Um, and it'll actually compare um, the fixed cost of a plant operating at the energy equivalent of the capacity factor minus the avoided cost of a power plant operating at the energy equivalent of the capacity value. Um, 
And that actually was uh, formatted by Gross in 2007, and it does have kind of a one-to-one -one correlation. It essentially lets you know how much other power plants do I need to build to meet peak load when I put on a renewable. And the challenge with that is then you have to go into the argument of, well, how much does a natural gas plant really cost in California? And by sort of ducking that formulation by using the ratio, um, I can just look at um, you know, which of those plants is, is substantially better at meeting peak load without getting into the argument of you know, exactly what dollars you want to use. Because had I done that study in 2008 when gas prices were at you know, $8 and now they're at $2, you get dramatically different results. So you're, you're absolutely right, though. There's some sensitivity to it. Sure. Yeah. Is, is presumably an optimization in where you put the, the farms. So I mean, you have this blue zone with a kind of a pink zone inside of it. Yep. If you put it in the blue zone, you might have to have a 60 kilometer transmission line. If you put it in the pink zone, you might have to have only 30. Where is it, where is it best to have them? Uh, that's a great question, and I don't know. It would actually probably be more dependent on the bathymetry, actually. So most of that blue stuff, especially as you get further offshore, is going to be just much too deep. So you might end up in the pink zone, which is still great. I think the pink zone was like um, over 9 meter per second winds, and those are phenomenal um, resources. That's about the wind speed that they're going after in the Cape Wind is over 9, I think even closing, closing in on 10. So yeah, I think bathymetry will be more of a deciding factor than the actual resource. Yes. Eric, where is that red wave generator located, the one you showed a picture of? Okay. Yes. Where um, is that, in North Sea or someplace? Or yeah, so when it was shown singly, it's at the European Marine Energy Center in Scotland. Scotland. Yeah, and that one's been in the water for several years, and they're actually on their second or even third generation. And then when it showed three of them in a row, it was for a failed and an abortive commercial um, effort in Portugal. So, yes. A question about the cost. Uh, are you actually taking the, into account the cost of things like insurance and so forth? I mean, if there's an accident in one of these things, large tanker, what's going to yeah. happen? Uh, are you paying <laughs> the power companies? You, you alluded to this, but it's not clear it's in your cost figure. Are you paying, paying the power companies to have capacity ready, like Denmark has to do, to make up for the gigawatts or megawatts that you're not going to be able to supply? Yeah, no, I'm not explicitly um, dealing with costs. Like, I'm dealing primarily with the technical aspects. So it's, it's a challenge to put all those costs, especially like insurance, in there. That's so, important. Yeah, <laughs> yeah certainly. Because they criticize a lot of things that have a 90-plus percent capacity factor, like nuclear, for having insurance problems. Yep, yeah. Yes? Well, what is the bird kill ratio uh, <laughs> compared to uh, the wind farms, say, we have here on, on the coast mm -hmm. and these much larger uh, windmill, uh, larger uh, <coughs> windmills? Uh, is there any? Yes. And again, I suppose you would also have to consider the number of uh, sure. uh, the smaller power ones that we have here and the power from one great big one? Yeah, again, I'm, I'm not an avian specialist, so I won't, I won't comment on that dangerous thing. Uh, the only thing I'll note is that um, the Altamont wind farm, which received most of the bad publicity, is much smaller wind turbines with different tower designs that actually encouraged nesting. Um, and these larger farms offshore, there's, especially in Denmark, they even deploy radars to see what happens when the birds come through on migration routes. So any of these farms, and even um, onshore wind farms, undergo extensive pre and post um, environmental monitoring, and then they have mitigation strategies to go in there. But to comment on which ratio, I wouldn't know. I don't suppose there's much uh, uh, possibility of using superconductors. Uh, yeah, not that I know of, <laughs> but yeah, maybe in the future. Uh, out there and be better hard to keep cold. Sure. <laughs> yes. Um, I was also wondering, would you by any chance know um, for the amount of energy that goes into creating these farms out in the ocean and the turbines themselves, um, how long it's going to take for them to start producing energy? Yeah, no, no. To, to offset the amount that went into it. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't know offhand. I know there are several. Been, there's been several papers that looked at. You know, you're manufacturing steel, and then you're manufacturing composite blades. Um, and I, I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head. It is positive for wind turbines, so. I don't think that study's been done yet for WAVE, though. So, so yeah, maybe we'll take uh, just one or two more. There was one Ooh, way in yeah. the back. So what fraction of the uh, energy, of the WAVE energy, might uh, 
farm take off? And would that could that affect the uh, ocean currents in the region? Or yeah, certainly. So um, I have several colleagues uh, in a network that are in Europe that are doing a lot of these studies of. Uh, they're looking at you know the extraction of wave power and what that does to the currents and especially sediment transport, and um, you don't actually so wind turbines you know at best collect the bets limits out of wind power or out of the wind so that's about fifty seven percent or so, um, and these wave energy devices are actually less efficient so you still have quite a bit of wave energy that goes through the entire field, um, so your capture ratio is you know somewhere south of fifty percent so you're still transmitting wave power through. And, and in really high wave conditions, which I would assume would do most of the sediment transport, the extreme sediment transport, those guys um, aren't capturing, they're, they capture increasingly less and less of that wave power. So they kind of have a target band of like um, waves in like four meter high in a period, energy period of maybe 11 to 12 seconds, which you kind of see in the North Sea or in, in, in Scotland. It's kind of like their, their ideal target where they're tuned to best capture that power. Okay, how about that is the last one, yeah. So related to that, as waves come on shore and the, and the ocean floor shallows up, the waves stand up, Correct. their uh, span shortens, and their height uh, amplitude increases, can you capture more in shallower water because more of your energy is at the surface as put down in the depths? Mm -hmm. And is that beneficial or, or destructive to have such larger amplitudes? So one device developer, the Oyster, is attempting that approach. They have essentially a flapping device that's pressurizing water. And they are in just before the sort of break zone. So you don't want to be in the zone where waves are breaking. Those waves are too steep and they're too nonlinear. So when you're, the ideal case is really great big swells that are fairly regular. Um, so that one device developer is trying to go onshore, but they're in a much you have much smaller power output at that band because you're losing a lot of that wave energy to um, the seafloor so as you're coming on shore. That's kind of why most of them want to be, you know, twice um, a depth of at least twice the wavelength. So they're kind of going to be 50 meters or more in, in water. So a lot of the energy does pass underneath and, and continues on then? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But it's still more than you get at the surface closer to shore. So. Well, I think we'll wrap up. Thank you. Thank you so much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.